I greet you in the name of the Lord. And, and I'm so glad that we can come together and we can uh, worship our Lord together. The, the book of Amos, we introduced it last week. And uh, last week we pointed out that Amos was not a trained prophet. Uh, in fact, he was a shepherd, uh, a, a layperson, if you will. And, and one of the unfortunate movements that has come in the Christian church, in my opinion, is the separation between clergy and lay. And we've made it so great that uh, among certain groups, uh, what the pastor says is like law, is like, uh, uh, and I think we should get there. Oh, no, 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 I don't. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy. Pastors are pastor teachers. Their job is to equip the saints. The saints' job is to do the work of the ministry, and we should not be dividing it so far apart. So Amos is a good example of God using anyone. And last week I said that uh, some of us have the just a uh, problem. Oh, I'm, I'm just a worker. I'm just a woman. I'm just a kid. I'm just a student. There's no just a with God. When God calls you and speaks to you, uh, you are his vessel and he will use you mightily, mightily. Uh, just to review a little bit, last week Amos this shepherd shows up from the south. He's from the two tribes of Judah. And he goes to the north. And he goes to the very center of idol worship at Bethel. And there, I, I think maybe he must have been a novelty. I think people gathered around saying, what is this shepherd going to say to us? And he began to uh, condemn the nations all around Israel. Remember, I had you practicing last week because when he would say, and the Lord will bring down fire on Ammon, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. Yeah, they, they, the people were right with him. Praise the Lord. They deserve it, those terrible people. And he went all the way around, and then he even went to Judah. But there was a distinction made when he came to Judah as what he was condemning. In the other nations, he was condemning violence and slavery and, and wickedly outward acts. But when he came to Judah, he said, they have rejected the instruction of the Lord. You see, he changed from the outward thing to the very inward. And he's going to continue on that. Now, then he turned, of course, to Israel, and they got real quiet. <laughs> because he said, judgment's going to come upon you because you've done the same thing. You've rejected the, the word of the Lord. And, and he's talking to uh, their hearts. Uh, Jeremiah describes the heart of man like this. The heart, human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how, to, how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search out the hearts. Examine the secret motives, and I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Jesus said it this way, it is out of your heart that comes these evil acts, and he named them. The heart is the heart that we have to deal with. The heart of injustice has two things. It is ignorant to the logic of God's judgment. And it is insolent toward the discipline of God. And, and I, I ask the forgiveness of, of those of you whose English is not your first language. I kind of stretch, had to stretch to get some of these eyes here. <laughs> that was just for my amusement. So uh, we'll, we'll explain them when we get to them, okay? But what's most important for you to hear is to hear the word. And so I'm going to read these two chapters. And I... Uh, you know, don't panic. One only has 13 verses and the other only has 15 verses. So it's not so long. But I want you to hear what Amos said, uh, inspired of God. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, beginning uh, with verse 1 of the New Living Translation. It reads like this. Listen to this message that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel. Against the entire family I rescued from Egypt. He reminds them once again. 
from all the families of the earth. I've been intimate with you alone. And that is why I must punish you for all your sins. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Does a lion ever roar in a thicket without first finding its victim? Does a young lion growl in its den without first catching its prey? Does the bird ever get caught in a trap that has no bait? Does a trap spring shut when there's nothing to catch? When a ram's horn blows a warning, shouldn't people be alarmed? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord planned it? Indeed, the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophet, prophets. The lion has roared, so who isn't afraid? The sovereign Lord has spoken, so who can refuse to proclaim his message? Announce this to the leaders of Philistia and to the great ones of Egypt. Take your seats now on the hills around Samaria and witness the chaos and the oppression in Israel. My people have forgotten how to do right, says the Lord. Their fortresses are filled with wealth taken by theft and violence. Therefore, says the sovereign Lord, an enemy is coming. He will surround them and shatter their defenses, and he will plunder all their fortresses. This is what the Lord says. A shepherd who tries to rescue a sheep from a lion's mouth will recover only two legs or a piece of an ear. So it will be with the Israelites in Samaria, lying on luxurious beds, and the people of Damascus reclining on couches. Now listen to this and announce it throughout all Israel, says the Lord, the Lord God of heaven's armies. On the very day I punish Israel for its sin, I will destroy the pagan altars at Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will destroy the beautiful homes of the wealthy and their winter mansions and their summer houses too. All their palaces filled with ivory, says the Lord. Now let's stop and, and, and recap what we see in chapter 3. First of all, he is saying, you don't understand my plan for you. The logic of God's judgment had some that had missed it. He said, first of all, uh, there's the irrefutable blessings of God, and you've ignored them. I chose you as my family. I chose Israel, uh, the whole of the nation, to carry my name. Now, was it because they were such good people? No. Over and over again, it says in the scriptures, they were stiff-necked and stubborn and wicked. They were chosen by God because of his divine sovereignty through Abraham would come the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But he, all the way along, God kept his hand upon them. He said, I delivered you out of, out of the slavery in Egypt. I loved you so much, I dwelt among you. Remember in the Old Testament, the, the tabernacle, it, it, was, it was there for the dwelling of God. Now we know that God does not live in a building or a tent for sure, he is, he is in all the, the world, but he said, I chose to be among you so that people would see what it is like to be loved by God, and instead you've rejected it, and therefore, I must punish you. People must see that God is just, and you are in just. And so then he says in verses 3 to 6, uh, there's an inescapable judgment of God. And sometimes we read this, we think, what, what is he saying here? There's six questions that have obvious answers, okay? Over and over again, these questions, can two people go in the same direction unless they agree on the direction? Well, of course not. They have to agree. Will a lion roar before it has his prey? No, because the prey would run away. He waits quietly until the prey comes, and then he pounces, and then he roars. He's won. Uh, and over and over, six of them. And then he says that you, you have understood those things, but you haven't understood what is really important. You haven't understand that disaster, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has planned it? 
In other words, what he's saying is, if those things are true, and they all are true, all of those things, it's just as true that disaster comes because God has allowed it to come and planned it to come. In other words, he's saying, I am still on the throne. And, and this makes sense because it is inescapable, the judgment of God. And then he gives them the indisputable message of judgment. Uh, and he says some very interesting things here. He says that God will always reveal his will. Now, he says through the prophets, but I say through the prophets, uh, through the word, through his Holy Spirit. God reveals his will for two reasons. Uh, first of all, then we can't dispute his will. <laughs> he reveals his will, and he has a plan, and he's revealed it, and we can't dispute it. If you want to see the, one of the strongest proofs that Jesus was really the Messiah, look at the Old Testament prophecies. 700 years, 400 years, 500 years before Christ, it was prophesied where he would be born, what he would do, how he would die to the very details of death on the cross that, weren't, that punishment wasn't even used when those words were written. So we cannot dispute his plan because he's already revealed it. And secondly, he gives us time to repent. God deals with your heart because he wants you to change, not because he wants you to be condemned, not because he wants you to be hopeless. When God speaks to you about sin in your life, it's because he wants you to have hope and he wants you to turn from that sin and repent. Even the unjust will recognize the hand of God. He, he calls for the, the people of Egypt and the people of, of the, the Philistines to come, of Philistia, and, and watch. Why? You know, what's the point of that? Those were the nations that were most considered unjust in that day. And he said, you want, I want you to come and watch because Israel's worst. God has favored them and they've still rejected him. I want you to see What's going to happen to them? And then the inconceivable judgment. Those who have forgotten how to do right. Wow. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the age we live in? People have forgotten how to do what is right. To do simple right things. And those who have made a wealth at the expense of their poor. Now we all live in countries, I, I think we all live, well, we all live here, so okay, I got it settled there, uh, where capitalism is, is what rules. And, and capitalism has a lot of wonderful advantages. It, it gets people up in the morning and they go to work, because if you work, you make money, and, and it, but capitalism has some very deep pitfalls, doesn't it? Because there are those who figure out the system and they know how to take the system and make it work for them, and they oppress the poor. They oppress the poor. Those who speak up in, in, in terms of socialism or some of the other isms in the world, they always point to that. Yeah, capitalism, wonderful. You oppress the poor. The poor get poorer and the rich get richer and in between seems to get smaller. And they carry the tax load, those in, the, in between, by the way. Uh, he said that's, that's not what I have called for. I am calling for you to repent of those things. And the, the judgment is coming is going to be so strong that your defenses will be shattered, your wealth will be plundered. All of that you've built up, all of those beautiful homes that you have, they're going to be destroyed. You're going to be carried away. And none of that will make any difference. And all that will be left will be an ear or a leg. When a shepherd uh, watched over someone else's sheep and a lion came and got one of the sheep and took it away to prove that he had not sold that sheep or not somehow uh, taken that sheep home and, and, and ate it with his family, he had to bring uh, what was left, an ear or a leg, and say, see, a lion was able to get this one. And, and Amos says, that's all that's going to be left, an ear or a leg. Now, there was a remnant left, but that was all. And then let's turn to chapter 4 and listen to what, how he repeats over and over again what they, their insolence toward God. They, 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 were, they were just 
rejected what God wanted. God disciplines those he loves, and the goal is always recovery. But he says, I've tried everything with you, and you have not turned back. Chapter 4, verse 1, listen to me, you fat cows living in Samaria. I'll explain that in a minute. He wasn't just insulting the women. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who are always calling your husbands, uh, bring us another drink. The sovereign Lord has sworn this by his holiness. The time will come when you will be led away with hooks in your noses. Every last one of you will be dragged away like fish on a hook. You will be led out through the ruins of the walls you will be, uh, that will, you will be thrown from your fortresses, says the Lord. Go ahead, offer your sacrifices to the idols at Bethel. Keep on disobeying at Gilgal. Offer sacrifices each morning and bring your tithes every three days. Present your bread made with yeast as an offering of thanksgiving. Then... You give, then you give extra voluntary offerings so you can brag about it everywhere. This is the kind of thing that you Israelites love to do, says the Sovereign Lord. I brought hunger to every city and famine to every town, but still you would not return to me, says the Lord. I kept the rain from falling from the crops needed it the most. I sent rain to one town and withheld it from another. Rain fell on one field while another field withered away. People staggered from town to town looking for water, but there was never enough. But still, you would not return to me, says the Lord. I struck your farms and vineyards with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your figs and olive trees. But still, you would not return to me, says the Lord. I sent plagues on you like the plagues I sent on Egypt long ago. I killed your young men with war and held your horses away and led your horses away. The stench of death filled the air. But still you would not return to me, says the Lord. I destroyed some of your cities as I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Those of you who survived were like charred sticks pulled from a fire. But still you would not return to me, says the Lord. Therefore, I will bring upon you all the disasters I have announced. Prepare to meet your God in judgment, you people of Israel. For the Lord is the one who shaped the mountains, stirs up the wind, and reveals his thoughts to mankind. He turns the light of dawn into darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, of God's, the Lord God of heaven's armies is his name. Now look at this second chapter. Uh, they were they 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 despised God. They they after he had done so much for them, they literally spit in his face. And so he says, indulgence leads to destruction. The fat cows, it literally is the fat cows of Bashan. Bashan is an area of Israel that was very uh, lush, got lots of rain, and so the cows there were well fed. So I don't think he was just insulting the women by saying you're like a bunch of fat cows. He was saying you are affluent. You, you have everything you need and yet you're indulging yourself and you're not sharing it with others and you're not worshiping right. The holy God, look at the contrast, the holy God cannot tolerate such injustice. You'll be led away with hooks through broken walls. You'll be thrown from your fortresses. Your houses will be burned down. Your indulgence will lead to destruction. I'm afraid we live in a time like that. That we live in a time of indulgence. We, 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 we want everything and we want better. Now listen to me carefully. God is not against wealth. Never has been, never will be. God is not against uh, people owning things. Never has been, never will be. But when we use them only for our pleasure and only for our good, and we blind our eyes to the needs of others, God is very much against that. We are stewards. The more you have, the more you have been trusted to use what you have for God. Be careful. 
Indulgence leads to destruction. And it leads also to irreverent worship. And that angers God. There's only a few things in the Bible that God says, I hate. He, he says, I hate divorce. But he says, I hate false worship. Why? Because it destroys the people. And look at what he's saying here. It's almost sarcasm, okay? Uh, Paul Ford uh, has this thing about sarcasm in the church, and, and uh, he and I were discussing this. That He said, that, well, God can be sarcastic. <laughs> he says, oh, go ahead and worship like you're doing. Look what the, how they were worshiping. First of all, they were worshiping at the wrong place. They were worshiping at Bethel and Gilgal instead of Jerusalem. God said, this is where you will come to worship. And they said, no, we won't go there because then the people would turn back to God. We're going to put our golden calves at Bethel, and you will come here to worship. It's the wrong place. It has the wrong devotions. They, they, they said, oh, every morning we will come to worship, and we will give our tithe every three days. Well, that's a, such an exaggeration. God called for the Israelites every third year to bring their tithe to Jerusalem, not every three days to Bethel. There were wrong sacrifices. He said, your sacrifice is made with yeast. The Israelites were forbidden to use yeast in their sacrifices because yeast in the Old Testament is a type of sin. And when you mix sin into your sacrifices and sin into your worship, you're despising the God who loves you. Wrong motives. Why were they doing it? Because they were, they could brag about it. <laughs> now, I'm old enough, you, you, you don't know how old I am, but I'm old enough to remember when we used to get pens for perfect attendance in Sunday school. And I remember there was a lady in my church that must have had 20 of them. <laughs> and, and on certain Sundays, she would wear them. And I always kind of thought, oh, you're bragging. You've been there every Sunday for 20 years. You must live in the back room. Uh, but uh, she, worship is not something we should brag about. It's not something that we should be uh, proud because we worship God. He is worthy of worship. We worship him because he is worthy not because what we get out of it and how we can brag about it. Then it goes to the inattentiveness to the love of God. God attempted to correct them, and, and it says in Hebrews that God punishes those he loves. He doesn't punish people he hates. He, 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 actually, the goodness of God leads people to repentance. But when people of God ignore him or reject him, Punishment will come. And here's what he said. I brought, look what he said in verse 6. I brought famine and hunger, and you didn't turn to me. I brought drought and sh shortage in verses 7 and 8. You didn't turn to me. I brought blight and pestilence. Verse 9, you didn't turn to me. I brought plagues and war. Verse 10, and you didn't turn to me. And then he said something quite spectacular. I destroyed some of your cities as I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a hand of God directly on a city, destroying it. And still, you would not return to me. They were inattentive to what God was doing. And instead of turning to him, they turned away. And so, you see that verse 12 begins with the word, therefore, there's an inevitable judgment to come. And he tells them, first of all, prepare to meet your God. Now, you can, you can take that phrase in at least three different ways. Uh, you can take it as a challenge, which probably we should. It, it is a challenge to us. Prepare to meet your, Lord, your God. Prepare. Uh, make sure your heart is clear. Make sure your ways are right. You can take it as an invitation. Prepare to meet your God. Oh, wonderful. During the days that Paul was here, he shared uh, with me the last days of his wife's life and how uh, she was looking forward to that time. And uh, God revealed to him that it was getting close. And he told her, you have my permission. And her son said, you have my permission to go. And, and it was, it was a, an invitation, and she accepted it and went to the Lord. 
But here, actually, it's a summons. It's a summons. I don't know if any of you, I hope you haven't, ever received a summons to come to a court. And I'm not sure exactly how the German system works, but I know in America, if you're, you receive a summons, you've been summonsed, you better show up because the penalty is very harsh. You are held in contempt of court if you don't show up. And here it says, you've been summoned to, to stand before God. Jesus made it very clear that there's coming a day of judgment. And therefore, while there's still time, we need to acknowledge who God is. And notice how he, he names who this God is. He's the God of creation. He shaped the mountains. He caused the winds to come and to go. He's the God of revelation. He reveals his thoughts to man. He turns the darkness into light. There are people that are in the church and they've been taught and then they come to Christ, but there are other people that just pick up the word of God. Or maybe in one short conversation, they turn their hearts to the Lord because God brings light. It's good that he uses witnesses and he uses his word. But God can reach out and touch people's lives and draw them to him that have never heard the message. God Almighty, Almighty over the earth, Almighty over heaven's armies. Look at the dangers that are uh, exposed uh, in Amos 3 and 4. Danger of forgetting the blessings of God. If you read in, in Romans chapter 1 and you see the, the steps away from God, people, God gave them over to their de defiled minds and, and down way. If you go back to the very top of it, you'll see how they began on that route. They began, it says, they knew who God was, but they failed to acknowledge him and give thanks. They failed to acknowledge him and give thanks. If you find yourself complaining more than praising, if you find yourself being disgruntled about what God has not done in your life or what God used to do and now he doesn't do or what God has taken away from you, be careful, you're walking on thin ice. When you forget to give thanks to God for the blessings that you do have, you're on the wrong path. They, they were so blessed and they rejected it. Clear, ignoring the clear commandments of God. God told them how they should worship. God told them how they should live. God told them how they should treat the poor. You know, is there a plan for the poor in the Bible? Absolutely. Clear back in the time of Israel, when they harvested their fields, God said, leave the corners for the poor people to come. Help out those. God always has had a plan for the poor. They were ignoring the clear commandments of God. Indulgence at the expense of the poor is, is a great danger. Worship according to our desires instead of God's. Be careful when you judge worship of others. Be very careful because uh, you are walking on thin ice. I've told some of you this story. When I was uh, in the hometown of my, uh, one of my brothers and I was so much wanting them to go to church, I decided that I would find the closest church to them and I would go there and somehow see if I could make a contact and, and they could come too. Well, the closest church to them was what uh, is known as a, as a high church, okay? Very formal, very liturgical. When I came in the door, they gave me a, a hymn book and, and, a, and a, 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 a missile and an and a order of service. The missile is kind of a, a plan. And so you have these three books and, then, and it's all up there above and you turn to 300, page 305 and there's a responsive reading and then you look in this and on the, the third Sunday of that month I was there and then you look over here on this and you... And about halfway through, I was trying. I, I really was, folks. I was trying. And about halfway through, I, I dropped them all down, and I thought, nobody can worship God like this. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw the lady sitting next to me. And tears were flowing down her cheek. And you could tell she was worshiping God. And God said to me, Ken, don't you ever condemn how other people worship. Don't you ever condemn how other people seek me. Now, there is the confines of the, of the word of God in the Bible, but this was a, 
This was a church, they were using the Bible. We read several Bible passages during that time. Worship according to our desires instead of God's is dangerous. You know, the kind of music you like in church says a lot more about you than it says about God. Okay? We need to accept that. We need to understand that. Church is split over the color of the carpeting. I don't like this. <laughs> church is split over how people color their hair or not color their hair or what kind of clothes they wear, what kind of jewelry they wear or don't wear. I was going to make that clear by wearing an earring this morning, but I couldn't find one. Uh, oh, afternoon, this afternoon. Yes, my wife always corrects me on that. Worship according to our desires instead of God's will bring judgment. And finally, failing to seek God in troubled times. You say, well, yeah, but it's a, what about this happening in my life or that happening in my life? I don't know why those things came. Some of those uh, came because, because you did something wrong <laughs> and you, you, you deserve that. Some of those maybe came because God's trying to get your attention. Some of those came uh, for reasons that we won't understand here on earth. But whenever trouble comes in our life, our first question should not be why, but what, Lord, are you teaching me? What, Lord, do you want in my life? What do you, how do you want me to grow through this difficult time? You see, Christians get sick. Christians die. Christians have car accidents. Christians lose loved ones. Those are hard things, and I'm not saying we should rejoice when those things happen. I don't, you know, if you get in a car accident, you don't jump outside your car and say, wow, look at that new design. <laughs> but I am saying that when difficulty comes, that's the time we need to be drawing close to God and seeking Him. You see, the issue is your heart. God wants your heart. Those who seek must seek with their whole heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. If you seek me and find me, when you seek me with your all your heart, all your heart, those who believe must do so with their heart. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is believing in your heart that you're made right with God and openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Those who have found him, and I believe most of that I'm speaking to today, if not all, you know the Lord. Guard your heart, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, for it determines the course of your life. When you lose your heart for God, you've lost your way in life. Those who serve him must have purified hearts. And I've mentioned already in Matthew 15, Jesus said, those things that corrupt us, they come out of the heart. But those who love him do so with their whole hearts. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. The question of Amos 3 and 4 if Amos had to roll it down to just a couple words, was, Israel, how's your heart? And the message for us this morning is, how's your heart this afternoon? I don't, I, I, I don't know. We, I think we should start worshiping in the morning. I think it's prophetic, uh, that I, because I always say morning. This afternoon, how's your heart? That's the question. How's your heart? Are you full of complaint or thanksgiving? Are you worshiping God because he is worthy or because somebody else will see you here? Are you serving the Lord with all that you have? Are you stewards of what you own or you think it's really yours? It's not, it's his. How's your heart? How's your heart? If your heart is right with the Lord, the judgment won't need to come. And the summons to his throne will be rejoicing because we'll be able to stand before him. Not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we'll stand before him. 
and say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. The grace of God has reached my heart. How's your heart this morning?